Today we're going to begin our discussion of reliability and validity covered in Chapter 6. But before we get started, we have to cover two concepts, statistical models and correlation, that's introduced in Chapter 5. A patient comes to you, and you just happen to be working in a bariatric practice, and says, if I have bariatric surgery, how much weight can I expect to lose? What do you say? You can't really be sure because the patient might not follow the post-op diet and therefore lose very little weight, or they could develop a post-op complication and lose a lot of weight. However, you're an experienced clinician and you know research demonstrates that most people who have bariatric surgery can expect to lose about 70% in the first year. Me weight loss of bariatric patients is a simple example of a model, and in some statistics books this is called effect. So a model, or effect, is a relationship between variables. Let's say the person elects to have the surgery and after one year has only lost 40% of body weight. How do we make sense of this? Well, we know the patient did lose 40% and this was probably due to the surgery. So our model explains why the patient lost some of the weight, but it doesn't predict why the patient lost less than expected. So there's something going on here the model doesn't explain. In short, while our model explains some things, it doesn't explain everything. Our patient's actual outcomes are made up of two far parts. The model explains or predicts effect, and what our model doesn't explain or predict, which is error. Put differently, individual outcome is model plus error. In this case, the model and error doesn't describe the patient very well. So as a clinician, whether you realize it or not, you're always comparing models to data. In this case, the model or effect was the mean weight loss at one year, and the data was the actual patient outcomes. If the model and the outcomes are not much different, then the model fits. If the model and the outcomes are different, then the model does not fit the patient. So when we make comparisons between models and data, we have to consider error. In statistical reasoning, the process is pretty much the same. You have a model, and you compare that model and the data from your subjects. If the amount of error to effect is large, then you see the model doesn't fit well. If the amount of error to effect is small, then it's a good fit. This is pretty much the basis of all statistics. Stated another way, data we observe can be predicted from the model that we choose to fit the data plus some amount of error. Not only can we measure how well data fits a model, we can measure how well model fits the data, also known as goodness of fit. These are two very different things. Does our model really fit the outcome? Do post-op bariatric patients really lose 70% of their weight in one year? If we want to know how well the model fits the data, we measure deviation from the model. By comparing data we've observed, to the model that we fitted to the data and square those differences. We'll do this later on. Let's revisit the original problem. Our patient didn't lose 70%. The model didn't fit the patient. Perhaps we've used the wrong model. Did our patient have Roux Y or gastric band? Gastric banding type surgery results in much less weight loss than someone who's had Roux Y. Perhaps we've used the wrong model. Regression statistics, covered later in this course, will compare models to data. For example, we could compare types of bariatric surgery to weight loss in one year and develop a prediction equation. The fundamental concept of all statistics is making comparisons between data and models and how well models fit the data. Remember this statement from slide two? A model is a relationship between variables. Correlation coefficients provide information on the strength and direction of relationships between variables. Correlation coefficients are introduced in Chapter 5. You'll notice in the first one that the data points all align in a positive direction. As one variable increases, so does the next. Look at the middle one. This is a negative correlation. As one variable goes up, the other variable goes down. In the third 
graphic, we see that the data points don't seem to go into any particular direction. There's no relationship here. So we can have negative, positive, no relationship, or curvilinear. We'll give you some examples. In a negative correlation, mortality increases as the degree of wasting in a patient increases. An example of a positive correlation is insulin resistance goes up as weight increases. There's no correlation between BMI and IQ. Here's an example of a curvilinear relationship. Obesity rates in children are lowest in extreme poverty and extreme wealth. There's further explanation on this on page 79 of your book. Correlation coefficients are expressed as Pearson product moment correlation, usually represented with a little r, and they can range from minus 1 to plus 1. Pearson r of 0 means no relationship. Plus 1 is a strong positive relationship. Negative 1 is a perfect negative relationship. And here is the equation for calculating Pearson's r. And here is the SPSS output. You can see I've circled Pearson's R as 0.77. Now, aren't you glad you spent that money for SPSS? It would be quite a laborious task to calculate Pearson's R for a data set of 300 people. How do you interpret the R? There's a nice chart in your book and here on the slide that shows you. 0.8 to 1 represents a very strong relationship whereas 0 to 0.2 is weak or no relationship. If you were to report the correlation from our previous example, again we'll go back to this correlation where height was correlated to the ability uh, to jump a long distance, we would write that as there was a strong positive correlation between height and jumping distance. Make note that on your assignments you have to report data correctly. So we spend a little time explaining error in a model and relationship between variables as measured by correlation coefficient. We first run descriptive statistics to understand our sample and then a correlation coefficient to see if our variables are related in a model. Then we attempt to reduce error in our model. Error is the difference between an actual value and the expected value. Remember that patient with an actual weight loss of 40 instead of 70 percent? If we can reduce error in our model, then our outcomes are much more reliable. Reliability is how well a tool test or model measures something consistently. Make note of that definition. There are four types of reliability discussed in your book. The first one is inter-rater reliability. This measures the variation in measurements when taken by different people but using the same tool. For example, several different nursing supervisors are using the same tool to evaluate the performance of an employee. Perhaps registered dietitians are collecting skin folds in a group of children. They're using the same skin fold caliper but they're coming up with different measurements or maybe the same measure. Perhaps RNs are completing a nutrition screen on a patient. Or, my favorite, a parent is rating a child's behavior and a teacher is rating that child's behavior. We want to know, are the observations equal when we are using the same tool? To measure inter-rater reliability, we examine the percent of agreement between raters. Here's an example. We have 10 variables that are rated by two judges, Mark and Susan. There was no difference in rating for eight of the ten variables, so we say the percent agreement is 80 percent. We want inter-rater reliability, or any reliability coefficient, to be a positive number and to be as close to one as possible. So we say we have a pretty good tool here in terms of inter-rater reliability. Then there's internal consistency reliability. This uses the Cronbach's alpha to determine if each test item assesses only one dimension by correlating the individual response to the total score. Questions must be consistent. One example of internal consistency might be a test of two questions. 
In the test, we have a question that says, you almost always feel like smoking. Later on in the test, we'll see a question that says, you almost never feel like smoking. If the person agrees with the first but disagrees with the second, then we say the test has internal consistency on this item. So, we correlate individual test item scores to the overall test score. Here is the statistical calculation of Cronbach's alpha, where k is equal to the number of subjects in your study. And here is the SPSS output. Again, aren't you glad that you have SPSS on your computer rather than having to compute these statistics by hand? An alpha of 0.7 or greater is acceptable. There's also parallel forms of reliability. This uses the Pearson's R that we talked about at the beginning to determine if two different tests measure the same thing equally well. Does a digital or a mercury thermometer measure a patient's temperature equally well? Is underwater weight equivalent to a bod pod for measuring body fat? Do two glucometers measure glucose equally in patients? There's also test-retest reliability. It also uses the Pearson's product to determine if a single test will be reliable over time. We might want to see if a satisfaction survey of patients discharged from the hospital is reliable over time. So we would give that at two weeks, four weeks, maybe even six weeks later and compare those results. However, a test can be reliable but not valid. For example, a bathroom scale consistently weighs a person at 125 pounds, but that person really weighs 150. The scale is reliable in that it measures the person at 135 every time, but it's not a valid tool. The types of validity discussed in this course are three. Validity is defined as, does a test measure what it's supposed to measure? There's content, criterion, and construct validity. In the first example, do test items represent all that needs to be known about a particular topic? Let's say that a group of nursing instructors want to know how to develop a very good simulation experience for some nursing students on heart sounds. They would begin by going to find an expert in field and asking them to write down all of the items that a nurse needs to know about assessing heart sounds. So it's pretty easy to do content validity on a test. Criterion validity is divided into two parts, concurrent and predictive. Will this test reflect current abilities and future abilities? So we want to know, does our simulation experience correlate at the novice level and the expert level? We could take our simulation experience on heart sounds and see if the student is able to identify normal and irregular patterns at the end of the exercise. We could take that same test and go out and see a practicing RNs who completed this simulation two years earlier are able to perform as well. Finally, there's construct validity, which is a little more difficult to measure. Do individual test items on a tool relate to a single construct. For example, let's say that there is a National Advanced Cardiac Nurse Exam. I don't know that there is, I'm just pretending. And we want to know if our nurses would score equally well on that exam as they do our nurse simulator exercise on cardiac sounds. So we correlate scores with a theorized outcome.